So we are live with our program, Organizing Your Genealogy Stuff. Um, so welcome, everybody. We're just going to give a couple minutes for people to get logged in. Um, my name's Melissa, and I have Megan with me. I don't know which way to point to her. <laughs> <laughs> so Megan is here, and um, she's going to do the program for us. So just um, a couple of housekeeping things that I want to mention. Um, we're doing a fun project in our maker space. Um, it's not open yet for library guests, but your um, my coworker Jenny, her her comment was, "You bring wool bling." So if you have a folder, you can pick like a family tree emblem, and we'll have forms at the library. We'll put a link online, and if you drop off a folder, something like this. We'll add an, a family tree emblem for you, and this can help you organize your stuff. Hey. So that's a fun project we have going on. If you have questions, feel like I always mention, feel free to drop us an email or call the information desk, and um, we'll put some links out for the forms. I also want to mention our next uh, program will be March 24th. We're going to do an afternoon program, and that program will is called What's Your Story? And that's with Jessica Brooks. She's from Battle Creek and she'll be doing hopefully and I think it will be an in-person program for us. Mm -hmm. So we have some things to look forward to. Um, so always watch our web page and our Facebook postings and you can see what's going on at the library. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Megan. Um, Megan is a genealogy guru and I've been had some chance or have some, I had some time to talk to her and she seems very busy. <laughs> um, but what I have enjoyed about getting to know Megan is that she calls herself hunting or she describes it as hunting down information. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that's, that makes genealogy fun when you, put it in that way. So I'm going to turn it over to Megan for her presentation and let her tell you what she does. And Okay. And uh, do you want me to go ahead and make my, my screen uh, full at this time? Sure. Yep. Okay. And welcome everybody. And I guess uh, I'll give you a little, little bit about me. Uh, my name is Megan Heil. I'm located here in uh, Holland, Michigan, so not too far away from Battle Creek. And um, I taught public school for over 20 years. And when I retired, I decided to take my hobby and turn it into a business uh, because I'm one that loves history and I love, you know, uh, putting puzzles together. So um, after I did that, I was uh, approached by several people and I ended up starting my own business called Hunting Down History. And, um, and at the end of this presentation, I'll put my business card up. So if anybody wants to write me, uh, email me, that would be great. Um, but anyhow, I, I do that. I have two different groups that I teach up here in the Holland, Ze Zealand area. Uh, one is the genealogy study group and the other one is my basics and beyond group. And we just talk genealogy and I have speakers or I'm the speaker and uh, it's really fun. We, we are doing nothing but Zoom now uh, until the, uh, the Zealand Library and we are able to get in there uh, when COVID starts settling down a bit. Um, not only that, I speak around the country and nationally and internationally. Uh, there are different organizations such as yourself in the Willard Library that um, ask me to speak for them. Um, I am the director for the um, International Society for British Genealogy and Family History, and um, I am their institute director, and we have a spring institute in March uh, that's going to be on Welsh research, and then in the fall we have our, um, our British Institute, which is held in Salt Lake City, and um, I'm also in the middle of uh, starting to write my first book, and, and uh, lots of stuff like that. So uh, without any further ado, um, you all should have received a handout with um, about 12 pages in it. And we'll be going over all of these pages and for our setting up our files and getting things going. So, well, anyhow, uh, once again, welcome. And I want to thank Melissa for having me tonight. 
And the name of our program, as she said, is, you know, what to do with this stuff or Operation Spring Cleaning. And this image, sometimes it feels like that. Uh, we are just buried under stuff. And hopefully by the end of the program today, you will all have a little bit of um, energy to start things. But just remember, there is no deadline. There is no timeline. There is no restraint on how long it's going to take. So let's say that you're cleaning out um, a relative's house or somebody shows up at your doorstep with a box and says, hey, you do that genealogy stuff. You're into that. We found all of this stuff and here you go. And they hand you a box. And what's in that box? Everything. I mean, it can it can be papers, it can be uh, fabric items such as letterman jackets or a flag that was on a casket for a funeral. It could be um, a lock of hair and you don't know whose hair it belongs to. So one person's trash is another person's treasure. And what we are going to figure out is what we're going to do with it and how we're going to make sense of it and what do we keep and what do we throw away and, and that type of thing. So I came across this image and this also makes me laugh and I have this on one as one of my screensavers. It says, you want me to get organized? Well, I'm going to hopefully help you here. So, so as we get started, we're going to talk about how we're going to clean it and how we're going to clear it and what we're going to keep. And one of the things are, that we're going to do first and foremost is we are going to clear your workspace you are going to want a clean desk. Well, sometimes if we're doing this program live, I usually have somebody in the crowd that wants to fall out of the chair, lay on the floor, say they're dead now and they're done um, just by saying clear off your desk. Well, anyhow, and in doing that, you're just going to give yourself, I call it the breathing space. This is the calm place. Now, what may be going on on the sidelines, you know, may be a little bit different, but you want to get it all cleaned off. And I also like to have supplies on hand and within arm's reach. Now, one of the things that I do have on my desk is a timer. And why do I have a timer? Well, because as easy as it is to sit at your desk and do genealogy for hours on end, I've got a husband that wants to eat, the dog that needs to be let out, the laundry that needs to get done. And the neat trick is, is if you start the dishwasher and the washing machine and the dryer, all that stuff is getting done while you do genealogy. So that's something just to keep in mind and a little chuckle. You're going to want to make a to-do list and you're only going to want to work on one family at a time. L listen to what I mean by that. There are things called forks in the road and there are things called rabbit holes. And trust me, you don't want to go down them because if you go down a rabbit hole and we all do, if you go down that rabbit hole, you're going to spend a couple of hours chasing something. That's not what you started off to do. So if you have a to-do list of what you're going to look for and try to research, then you will have a sense of accomplishment and start getting things pulled together and, and getting working on your genealogy. We're going to help you clear your files, whether they are paper files or electronic files, and you're going to want to keep them organized and do it often, okay? You want to keep your discoveries in order, and what I mean by that, you're going to, anything that you find and come across, you're going to keep them in order two ways. You're going to do it chronologically, and you're going to do it alphabetically. So therefore, you're kind of putting, when you put these papers in and you've got a, a paper from 1930 and then a paper from 1910, let's say an immigration paper, 1910 comes first, not so much the 1930, that one's going to be behind and later. So when you do this, you're going to keep your pe people in order and you're going to keep your time in dates in order. So what may work for you is not going to work for me. And what works for me does not work for my husband. I'm an artistic brain and I like working with colors and you'll see in an image coming up here in just a little bit, um, some ideas of how I color coordinate all of my families. My husband's an engineer and if any of you are engineers, bless you. Um, you love working with folders and you love working with spreadsheets and, and, you know, and if that works for you, all the green folders my husband has does not work for me because I, like I said, I'm a color person. So anyhow, um, any mess that you make on your desk, unless you can get your mom to come over and pick up after you, you're going to have to clean up after yourself. 
So therefore that we're going to keep working on, on how to keep things organized. Um, I always tell everybody that Staples, Myers, Walmart, and, and Office Max, some of those are open 24 hours. And you're going to want to keep certain items on hand because if you're like me, you'll get caught up in researching and you don't want to quit and you run out of ink or you run out of printer paper. And, and we'll get to that in just a little bit also. But one of the things that you want to do is to make sure you do have supplies on hand because you don't want to absolutely have to stop because of a lack of those things. And once you start, you're going to want to come up with a system and you're not going to want to change midstream unless it's totally not working for you. There are many books. I'm sure the Willard Library has got some books on organization. There are websites online that you might want to go check out about uh, different ways of organizing and how to do this. So as we talked about clearing our desk, I've got two baskets and a uh, Fortunately, they, they happen to be long and burger baskets, but they can be wire baskets or even box top lids from from um, a, like a banker's box or a, a case of green beans. You know, that can be an a, a, a inbox tray and an outbox tray. And in my inbox tray, I put papers that has got to be put into my spreadsheet or got to be put into my uh, computer program or that I need to make a note of or something. Um, anything that I've picked up on a research trip. All of that goes in my inbox until I can take care of it. And once I start taking care of it and going through it, and, and usually about every other Sunday, I have to sit down at my desk and I've got it down to an art now that it only takes me maybe an hour to do that. Um, and it stops me from doing it like every day. I just rather do my filing all in one clean sweep there. Um, so what goes into my outbox is after I've taken care of it, after I'm like, oh goodness, I got a death certificate this week for my husband's mother and the date that she died is confirmed on the death certificate, not what was said in the obituary in the paper. So I make sure that I record that in my notes. And that's just an example of something that you're going to want to do. Once I've taken care of that data and put that information, that goes in the outbox for the filing. You need to make sure your desktop space works for you. And you're also going to want good lighting. There's nothing, you know, we're all, we're not getting younger. I haven't found that fountain of youth yet. Um, the glasses start needing to be trifocals and bifocals. Um, you know, it. you just need to deal with um, being able to see and make your work area as comfortable as possible. Um, I already talked about scheduling a time to file and make lists and and we'll go over who to call down the road here in just a little bit. And my bookshelves, how do you want to organize them? Now, I happen to have one bookshelf right here by my desk that has all sorts of reference materials on the state of Michigan and on the state of Illinois where my husband's family is from. That is just all here. So if I need anything Michigan and Illinois, it's over here on this bookshelf. I was able to have my husband take my double closet here in the office and tear out the pole and he built me shelves and that's my library. And so therefore, a lot of the reference and uh, research items that, that I need a lot of times, I've got it right here. I've collected it. I've been doing genealogy for 20 years and you know, and it has worked out great that I don't need to wait till a library opens so I can go borrow a reference book. I have probably for the most part gotten it on heaven on my shelf. So you're going to want to arrange it by category or by region or research type. So I talk about how I like colors. And if you were to open my drawer, this is what my drawers look like. I have certain family names with certain colors and that works out great for me. My binders are the same colors. My folders are the same colors. My Pendaflex holders are the same colors. For me, it is easier so that when I see, let's say, the color blue, I know my maiden name. If I want anything dealing with my maiden name family, then I just look for the blue folders. And and that works for me. And But like I said, you've got to make it work for you. I talked about having supplies on hand and everything from files and pens and calculators and markers and post-it notes. Um, I even have color coordinated paper clips. I, I get a little bit over. My husband says that I get a little bit over the edge on that, but that's okay. These clear plastic 
file boxes. You will be gathering such things as CDs. You'll be gathering pamphlets, purchasing little booklets from different genealogy societies, conferences, um, used bookstores, that type of thing. How about the library sale? If you've got a library book sale and um, you pick up a couple of books or pamphlets dealing with either local history or the area that you're researching, put them in these file boxes. These work out great. And the box below that I have this exact box. This is not my paperwork, but it's a great picture showing, okay, I've got different colors. And so my blue file folders will have my, my maiden name in there. And then I have another one for another color for a different maiden name. And this is what I take to my libraries and when I do my research, because all of my important papers that we'll be discussing here in a minute are lined up and look just like this. Okay. So now we're going to let the fun and games begin and we're going to start filling out paperwork. Now, let me tell you that all this paperwork is good and helpful and handy, but all this paperwork may not be necessary for what you're working on. And I'll go through and explain it all to you. And all of these are in your PDF packet that um, Melissa and the library has sent to you. So one of them is called my folder naming, and this is my surname. And many of you may or may not be aware of a thing called a banker's box. You can buy them individually or buy the dozen. They're very sturdy, corrugated boxes with a lid where you can write on the side. And so I've got several for the different family, you know, surnames that I've got. And when it says file contents here and it says record type and that, you don't, I don't necessarily fill it out exactly, but my surname for my maiden name is Kroll, C-R-O-L-L. And what I do here is I will come across a whole bunch of stuff and I put it in the box. And then on this folder naming surname one is where I just kind of generally say, oh, I got um, a photo album from somebody. I got a diploma. I got a death certificate. And I build my box of stuff. That person that came to your door with a box or a suitcase or whatever it was um, of stuff for you to take care of, you could put that all into the, the crawl box or whatever it is. Because, you know, usually when they show up at your door, that's not the greatest time for you to stop and go through it. And so this just kind of tells me the contents of what's in there and who gave it to me and that type of thing. So then the next form is when we are naming a couple or a family group. So let's say I've been given a whole bunch of things and photos and, and paperwork for my grandfather. Well, in that big box, and if and this is just for a visual, let's just say that banker's box has got a whole bunch of shoe boxes in it. Now, technically, they're going to be file folders and that type of thing. But um, but what you're going to do is like there's going to be a box with my grandfather's name on it. There's going to be a box with my father's name on it. There's going to be a box with my great grandfather's name on it. And anything that deals with my grandfather's family, my dad's family, which would mean me, my brother, my mother and him. Um, my grandfather had two sons, so that would be him and his wife, my grandma and grandpa, and my uncle and um, his, you know, and then my dad. So it's it's going to be, you're going to want to separate what family this stuff belongs to. And that's where this comes in to say, oh, I've got some uh, um, employment information from my grandfather. Um, many of you may have heard of the Packard Motor Company. My grandfather worked for Packard Modi Motor, and I have received quite a few things, even his, uh, his employer ID card. And so that kind of stuff all goes into there. You don't need to sort it and get it all totally organized yet, but this is just taking one step at a time. So one of the things that people like to have, and it, it is kind of going a little bit out of order, is they want to start filling out family tree charts. And I highly recommend, and you'll be seeing in the here in just the next couple of slides, the family tree charts and the, the ancestral charts that I use and that most people use. Now, a lot of people like this, and it makes great wall art, but it's not practical at all. 
And I'll give you an example where they just throw out at the bottom, they want your name and then they're going, then they want you to put in the parents and the grandparents and kind of work up. And an example of it being great wall art is illustrated in this picture. This is a great little wall, you know, collage type thing that this family has got going on. And it's, and it's interesting and it's a little bit educational. And so the next one is um, either a pedigree or ancestral chart wall art that is also not practical. And a lot of times we've seen these and because, you know, it's not very easy to put everybody in on one of these when life is not just parents, grandparents and great grandparents and so on. There are deaths and, and divorces and remarriages and more than one or two children. So if you are going to work on exactly your direct line, this is, this is okay. But just want to let you know, just don't think you can go out and get one of these and just fill it all in without there being a couple of errors in the way. So the chart that I was talking about earlier can be called either a pedigree or an ancestral chart. Okay. And what we always do with these um, is we always start with ourselves. So the very first line on the very left, it's you put your name there, you put down and on this, this form, you know, um, it, it kind of self-explanatory, you put down um, when you were born and where, when you got married and where, and if you died and where, so obviously somebody's going to fill that in. And then below is the spouse's name. The next step up and men go on top and the women go on the bottom. And so the next one would be your dad. Now, your dad may or may not have a middle initial. He may or may not have a middle name, but the name that he is given at birth goes on that top line. The name that goes on the bottom line to the person he married is the maiden name of the of the lady so it's your your mother's first name middle name or initial and her maiden name because they are married because it gives here at the top it'll show uh the place for when they got married now let's say that um your grandfather was uh married twice or your dad i'm gonna just say was married twice then you will have two forms you will have one for the first wife and if there's any children that were involved are born to that union, and then you'll go to the second one and that type of, you know, and, and it'll be very easy once you get going on this. The next one I'm going to show you is what's called a five generation chart. So looking at this one, you see that there's you and then two generations, and then you can put the names in. Well, this is how a five generation chart looks and it's just a little bit more. It gives you some reference material on the bottom. You've got all of these, uh, all these slides that are white in background, except for the next one, are all in your packet. Now, the reason why I am comparing this one to the next one is I want to let you know that depending on a lot of times, um, sometimes of different um, religions, sometimes of different ethnicities, that you're going to find ancestral or pedigree charts that look different. And case in point, and this one has a black slide because of the contrast, and I wanted you to see it. The Church of the Latter-day Saints or the Mormons, um, this is what their pedigree chart looks like, which is quite a bit different. And I'll go back one from what the very simple form of birth, marriage and death, that type of thing on a typical one. So this one includes and you will see little teeny boxes and there will be a capital B for when the person was baptized when they were endowed, sealed to their parents, sealed to a spouse. A family group record exists with the church. And if all the children's ordinances have been completed. So if you are a member of the Church of the Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, this is what your pedigree chart will look like with the check boxes that to be complete, that needs to be done. So that's just uh, an idea. So another little fun thing that if we were that if we were live and, and doing this in person um, is one thing that I like to call a relationship chart. And a lot of times I like to use these forms as a quick view and understanding just an at a glance of where everybody is in my family. And this one, you start the darker box. 
there, excuse me, um, says you start here and that is you and your name will go in there. You see that your parents, your parent is up there. And so then you can go to your grandparent and your great grandparent and so on and so forth. It talks about siblings, nieces and nephews. And then it starts understanding and explaining when you hear something about, oh, they're my first cousin once removed, or they are my fourth cousin three times removed. When you start filling this all in, it's all going to start making sense to you as you build this extended family relationship chart. But remember, 99% of the time, you always start with you. And that keeps it a little bit easier. So when you get this partially filled out or the ancestral chart that we showed, um, like the five or four generation, that type of thing, at a glance, you're going to go, wait a minute. Okay, that's where Walter fits in. I get it now. And sometimes it's really good just to have that, just to look at. Now a little comedy break for you. Yes, believe it or not, Disney has made it so that Donald Duck has a family tree. And yes, this is correct. So one of the things that we are going to talk about now, even though it says it's going to be a cartoon break, is we're going to talk about doing some naming things. And this one, um, as, as you can tell, um, there the boy says, hey, you know, uh, Hector was named after his great, great, great grandfather. And the dude was a hero in the Battle of San Gabriel during the Mexican-American War. And they wanted to know the little the boy went to his parents and asked him why he was named Jeremy. Well, it was because back in the time, Jeremiah was a bullfrog was a hit song and the parents just couldn't uh, bring themselves around to um, to ex describing that. So why are we going to talk about names? It'll come apparent here in just a little bit. So we're going to think outside the box. And if we were once again in person, I would be handing everybody a, uh, a index card. And yeah, I've got the colored ones. And what I will have you do, and you know, and you don't need to do it right now, but uh, maybe take a note on a piece of paper on the back side of one of these forms, or if you happen to have a little notebook there or something like that, is on the top line, I want you to write your name. I'm not going to go into any uh, description of what or how, but I want, but whatever is your name, I would like you to put it on the top line. And then on the lines below, I would like you to write down all the other names that you go by. And I'll take a sip of my hot tea while you just make a little note of that. And it saves my throat too. Okay, so now I'm going to give you an eye-opening surprise. And I'm going to give you the list of my names. And I kind of put it in a wordly or in a word cloud or uh, whatever the latest phrase is. And these are my names. Well, the reason that the name Sharp is at the very top there, and it's just it just does it randomly, is um, that is the last name of my first husband. And so I, I've been known to be Sharp. I'm a genealogist. The next one is Megan Leslie, and that's the name I get called when I'm in trouble by even my 90-year-old mother. Uh, so anyhow, it's my first middle name. Hunting Down History, the name of my business. Megan is my first name. W-O-0-M-E-G in the middle, that's my amateur call sign name. Um, I've been known as the genealogy huntress. Um, I've been called kiddo. The reason why sunshine is there is because my uncle, um, the, day, the day after I was born, and he came over to see me and picked me up and was burping me, and I ended up throwing up all down his shirt. And he said, well, aren't you just a little bundle of sunshine as he's handing uh, me off back to my mother. And so I've been called sunshine for over 60 years. So these all come into play. Uh, Kroll there you see is my middle name. Heil is my now married name. Um, Jester because I teach and people have said that I'm a class clown. So all of these names I go by, you know, um, and you need to write down all the names that you go by. So why is it important and why do we need to know this? Because remember that names change. And here's another example. So in this photo, I got an arrow pointing to a young man and I'm going to ask, what is his name? You take a minute until it sinks in for those of you that would know and recognize who this family is. So is this young man, was his name, his real name, Jack or John Fitzgerald Kennedy? 
And a lot of times people, if we are live and in person, you're going to have several that say it's going to be one and several that's going to say it's going to be the other. So just for your information, he was born John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And of course, a lot of people just call him JFK, that type of thing. You may not realize that this May, he would be turning 105 years old. And he died in 1963 at the age of 46. And believe it or not, that was 59 years ago this year. Hard to believe because JFK and all this information kind of stays with us. And, you know, it keeps returning in the news now and then. So why the, what's in the name? So when you're sorting documents, you want to try to use the legal name given at birth and do not correct spelling. A lot of times it is spelled a certain way. I have got a friend whose name is Michelle and the mother only had one L in it. And it's not often you come across a Michelle with one L. But do not change the spelling because that's what it was. Okay. You want to notate a nickname. And if that nickname, you need to be aware, I've got a friend named Michael, but he goes by Bubba. And there are legal documents that have Bubba as the name on it, but that is not his legal birth name. Okay. So you're going to want to watch out for that. Um, my mother is from Oklahoma and her first name is Billy. Her, la her middle name is Gordon. But down in Oklahoma and in th that age group, everybody put first and middle names together as in one word. So Billy Gordon or Larry Lee or Ruby June. And a lot of times those two names, the first name and the middle name, are pushed together into one name. So you need to do your research to find out if that is like Ruby June, is that all one word or is that two words put together? And it's definitely a first name and a middle name. You're going to always want to try to maintain the legal last name whenever possible. And therefore, when you've got multiple marriages or adoptions or, or name changes, you're going to need to work with that. On multiple marriages, um, you know, the lady may go by her latest husband's last name if she legally took it on to be that. There are a lot of times women just keep their maiden name. They don't use their husband's last name and have not taken it on. So something else that I want you to consider is we're going to talk about some headstone headlines. And you saw just briefly ago that we talked about JFK. And here, this is a picture at Arlington and the eternal flame. And you see two big granite squares there and two little squares. And so I want to know if you know what name you are looking for and what did you find? So, for example, the first one here says John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and that says 1917 to 1963, okay? The one next to him is Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy Onassis. If you recall, Jackie Kennedy remarried several years after John Fitzgerald Kennedy uh, was, was killed. So, anyhow, so they did put on her headstone her legal last name. They had a son that only lived two days, and that was Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. And he is buried there in the family plot. And then they had a daughter. And the birth date is August 13th, 1923. And you're thinking, wait a minute, this is the president of the United States. Why isn't there a name on this headstone? Why does it just say daughter? Well, the name they were going to give this child was Arabella. And she died at birth and was considered stillborn. And why doesn't the daughter have a name? Well, they were Catholic. She was not christened. And since Jackie, and they considered it being a miscarriage, uh, giving birth to a stillborn, there was no formal name given. So in correct and proper procedure here, there it was no given name. So that's why this one just says daughter. A lot of times when we are in person, somebody says, yeah, but what happened to Jackie's second husband? Well, Aristotle Socrates Onassis, uh, for those of you that don't know, he was a shipping magnet, the world's uh, most rich and famous man. And when he passed away, uh, the picture on the right is the mausoleum 
and then his crypt is there in the middle and he's buried in the Scorpios Island in Greece. And that's where his family and all that is from. So, so Aristotle is over there and Jackie was buried with her first husband, not her second husband. Another thing about headstone headlines is when you go to cemeteries and you're looking for uh, the burial place of people, I says, you're going to come across many of these things. One that just says baby, one that says father, one that says daughter, like we just saw. The lower right hand corner, it says the words on there are our, not our, but our baby, April 28, 1933. The middle stone says Grimes, and it says beloved wife, mother, and Nana, and it shows that there, she's a registered nurse. And then on the other side, beloved husband, father, and Pop Don. But it doesn't give you any first names. We can't be sure that it's a Don that was there. We don't know. That could have been a nickname. But this is an example of headstones without any formal names on them at all. So once again, you're going to have to do due diligence and find out who is buried there. And then the other one is one of the famous ones that in the genealogy uh, community. And the last name was Spanks. And it says Arthur Spanks' wife, Catherine. Well, could there have been a better way to, you know, talk about that or to say, yeah, there could have been. But anyhow, this one always brings a little chuckle um, instead of saying Arthur Spanks and then his wife, Catherine, instead of just reading it as one sentence. So when you're organizing your notes on your family and photos of headstones, there must be a reason why they have done this. Maybe those headstones that say baby was another situation like at, uh, for Arabella Kennedy, that type of thing. There's got to be a reason, okay? Keep in mind that even though there may be a headstone with just one family name, the surname, that there could be more than one person buried in a grave. It depends on if it was a full body burial, it could be cremated uh, burials, or a combination of both. And the rules will vary state by state and country by country. Usually you can have one full body burial, or you can have four cremains all in one grave. A lot of times you can have one full body and one or two cremains. It it varies as, as often as there as many as cemeteries there are. So always check with the cemetery sexton to have them check their notes. And remember, their notes may not always be correct. So good luck. Mark your family sheets correctly and make sure you keep organized. You're going to save a lot of time and money down the road if you need to go make another trip back to a cemetery or have somebody help you uh, do this research for you. So we're going to start getting started on organizing here. We've already kind of gotten a start, but we are going to talk about filling in some of these forms and getting your files in order, okay? So one of the things that we're going to talk about, and some of these are the ones that I talked about is I, I like having at a glance type of thing. And one of them is going to be uh, the source summary for family information. So uh, the whole surname stuff. A correspondence record with surnames, family group records, and a research log. And I will get to that in just a few seconds. So a family group record. And when I go traveling, I have this paper with me all the time. And what this shows is that the husband is at the top and it gives all the information that you need about the husband. And then the wife is underneath it. And it gives all that information about the wife. And then it has 12 lines for children. And you think, oh my goodness. Well, my husband's from Southern Illinois. And it's a farming community, and it is not unusual to have 8, 10, 12 kids. Matter of fact, one of my family members, they had 18 children. So I needed a separate form, you know, an additional form to add on the extra six children. Um, and that family, three of them passed away as, as young children. But you needed people to help work your farm. So these family group records are a great way just to see what order the people are in at a quick at a glance type thing. Now, what a source summary is for family um, information is let's say that you've gone someplace, uh, a library or a repository or an archive or, or wherever it may be. And this is just an idea of notes. You don't have to follow it to the T. It may or may not work for you. But let's just say that you are looking at a microfilm roll 
So you're going to want to put down the number of that microfilm roll so that you're able to, when you cite your, your source, your citations um, and, and do that and get all of that information there, you've got the details. You want to be able to, whenever you list some information that if you were to give me your family tree and your information, I should be able to go exactly to that building, let's just say the courthouse, and to that book, and to that page, and find what it is where you got your information. Getting people's information off the internet is not wise. A lot of people will, I call it CPP, they copy it, they paste it, and then they post it, and without doing the research, and do not fall into that trap. Make a note of it to see if it's something that is true or not till you do your own research. But do not copy and paste and post other people's research because if you don't know them, you don't know that the facts are, are true and, and available. So this is going to kind of help you list your sources of where you found certain information. A research calendar. I like to know when I go to, for example, Southern Illinois and where I've gone and what I looked for. A lot of times, and one of the things that you will want to, to find out is if you do research ahead of time and know that you're going to go to a certain library, let's say, and for example, my dad's side of the family tree, they are Welsh. My mother's side is Cherokee Indian. Well, there is a library in Ann Arbor, there, one of the historical libraries there, that has the book on the Welsh church that was in Detroit, Michigan, way back in the 50s and the 60s. They are the only place in the state of Michigan that has that pamphlet book. So I am going to put on here that the next time I'm near Ann Arbor, I'm going to write in that book name, write in the library name, write in the call number. And that way I am not going to waste time on their computer doing the research in their catalog. I'm going to take this research calendar list with me and say, I'm going to Ann Arbor. I'm going to look up this book. I can go right to it and then see if I, I'm able to... Um, you know, scan it or something like that, whatever the rules are at that facility. A research extract. I used to take a ton of index cards with me, and a lot of times I still do. And if you cut along that dark black line, this kind of gives you a filled out card. And what this is going to do, it's going to give you the name of the file or the name of the book, and it's going to, you know, you can write in the call sign and what where you found it. And you're going to want to take notes. For example, if this book in Ann Arbor is not going to serve me any purpose after I've looked at it, I'm going to make a note that this book has nothing to do with the time or my or my ancestors that went to that church. Why am I going to write that down? Because I do not want to down the road go, oh my gosh, a year or two now. And I said, hey, they've got this book. I can go to my research extract and go, oh, already looked at it. Not worth my time and carry on. So it's always good to keep notes and keep this like in a file, that type of thing for you. My correspondence record is fabulous. Um, I like this because what I do is when I contact, um, let's say, the Tulsa, Oklahoma Library, and I talk to the lady, and I'll just pick a name, I'll call her June, uh, who is there, who has helped me, I'm going to write down the address and and of this library. I'm going to write down the person who I spoke to. I'm going to write down how they helped me. And if I am waiting for any type of a response, I can mark that in here, uh, the date that I sent an email and a date if they replied, that type of thing. And I also use this for when I send out my thank you notes. And I'll get to that in just a little bit. But anyhow, I want to know who has been helpful just as much as I want to know if, if uh, I'll just use my name, Megan, uh, picks up the phone, um, I may want to ask for June because Megan has not been helpful and that type of thing. So I even make notes in here of who you want to stay away from because you've had a bad experience, okay? So anyhow, correspondence record is great. It's kind of like your little uh, black book of um, addresses, that type of thing. Now, coming up here, I worked with this company many years ago, and this is called Census Tools for Genealogy Research Log. And on here, I would recommend that you make a copy of this or a very similar research log and make one for every single person 
in your direct line. Do it for you. Do it for your husband or husbands. Do it for your dad. Do it for your mom. Do it for your dad's parents. Do it for your mom's parents. Because you can do it for everybody that you have in your tree. But this is going to keep you organized on your direct line. And every time you come across something, you're going to want to put a check mark. Now, you'll see that at the very right side that it says online sources, and I have added that in because so much of us are online looking on different, re, on different sites that you can write in, let's say, find a grave. And was it helpful on my dad? Yes, because there's a memorial there with information. Or no, there is no memorial there, and somebody may need to go in and do that. Um, you can go to, I'll just pick Family Search or Ancestry or My Heritage or Scotland's People. Whatever website I go to, put a check mark in there if that website was helpful or if it's not helpful. Now, just a little COVID clue. Since most libraries and things have been basically closed for two years, they have been very busy digitizing and uploading the things that they have found. So I would highly recommend about every three to six months, you pull the research log out again and take a minute. And if something wasn't there, or like you've got to know on one of those check marks, then you want to go back in and see if something hasn't um, become available and helpful for you in your research. So you're going to want to make sure that you've got some type of a label maker so that you can, you know, do it nice and neat on those little tabs. Um, for me, I like to color code my files and my folders. Um, I like to even color code my supplies, which, you know, now, you know, you can all just kind of giggle at only different colored paper clips, et cetera. Um, I sometimes use colored paper to divide in these binders that I'm going to show you in a minute. And when you do your labeling, I'm going to highly recommend that you come up with this little or use this program, uh, do what works for you once again, but I haven't had any problems in all the years I've been doing genealogy by using this. The first thing I put in is the surname and it's in all capital letters. When you see some a word that's in all caps, it's going to get your attention. And so therefore, when I see crawl, it's going to, it's going to help me out there. Now, my dad's first name was Robert and his middle name was Donald. But a lot of times you will just see a middle initial. You may use that middle initial, but if you know the middle name, write out the middle name. You may then want to, after in, in a certain file that you've got, you, for example, death records. Any of the records that I found dealing with his death, including um, information from the funeral home and, uh, you know, the, the little pamphlets, the ephemera that they, they hand out when you usually go to a funeral and what verses have been said and that type of thing. Um, all of those things can go under death records and you can list that in your uh, family history, that type of thing. And one thing that I will recommend also is that you always put the year. And for my dad, it was 1930 to 1992. And here's something that you may or may not be aware of is patronymics. And what that means is a lot of times, and especially in European and like the United Kingdom, that a father's name will then flip for the son's name, which will then flip back for the grandson's name, et cetera. You will also come across um, a situation. So that's why you'll want, you know, if you've got two uh, Robert Crowles and they're, uh, you know, 50 years apart, you've got the birth name or the birth year there. That's going to help you figure out which Robert Crow you're wanting to, to look for. Another thing that, and a little quick story about a client I had is when doing her research, I came across two other children that were born to the parents that she did not know anything about. And the thing that was most upsetting is that these other two children had her name. So what I mean by that is they had a child, a daughter born in January, and I'll just uh, come up with the name Rosemary. And so they named this baby girl Rosemary. And shortly after her birth, she died. They got pregnant right away. And in December of that same year, they had another girl and they named that girl Rosemary. And she lived a little bit longer and she died. 
And about a year later, they got pregnant again and had another girl and they named her Rose Marie. And that was who my client was. So therefore, if you've got two children with the same name, born to the same family in the same year, instead of just putting, let's say, 1930, you're going to want to put down, let's say, January 1st, 1930. And the next one is going to be December, whatever, 10th, 1930. And there you're differentiating the two births in that family. So just, just a little hint that names do get reused. And why were they? Because Rose was her mother's name and Marie was her husband's mother's name. And they put them both together. So that's why they kept having girls and wanting to use the grandparents' names, that type of thing. An example of file color coordination. Here's just a great way. Uh, here's a box that will look a little bit familiar. And these are archival safe boxes in the middle. And just what all of us wish that our offices looked like and as, as clean and organized as possible because guaranteed you're going to need some document. Somebody's going to, you'll come across a cousin that contacts you and you'll want to share, let's say a death certificate or a birth certificate or something like that. You're going to be able to go right to it and find it. So remember that um, when you're dealing with your paperwork and organizing that there are numbering systems and everybody gets a number. And that was under the, the German uh, name for this is called a an Anatafel. And so an anatophel is an, a German, you know, an ancestry chart, and everybody's going to get a number, and you're going to be able to figure all of that out. We already talked about how on those ancestral forms, the males are on top and the females are below. Males are given even numbers, and females are given odd numbers. And most software programs, if you happen to have a software program for your computer, they will automatically calculate this and it will print it out on the charts for you um, so that you can share or just use. You may not want to share your, your research um, or you're going to maybe want to put it together in a book, uh, give to the newlywed couple or the grandkids. So you're going to want to make sure that all of your dates and places are in Gregorian system, which is international. We do not use that here in the United States. The way to remember and the way that I remember is think small, medium, large. So therefore, for when you're doing a date, get in the habit of putting the day first, the month, and then the year, small, medium, large. The day is small, the month is medium, and the year is large. And the same way you do places. So for me, it would be Holland. It'll be Ottawa, which is Ottawa County, and then Michigan, and then the United States. So once you get in the habit of doing that, all of your paperwork, because if you've got family that has come from overseas, this is how they do all of their numbering system. So you're just going to want to be consistent. Keep in mind the big picture, your pedigree and your charts and your family tree charts, because you're just going to want to have it at a glance. All right. I use color coded binders. I've alphabetized all my surnames. I've put all of my information in chronological date order. So it kind of makes a timeline and you can get a photo album or a scrapbook and keep photos and and things like that and cemetery entrances and and headstones and, and all sorts of little uh, things, paraphernalia that you may want to help dress your skeleton, make, make them come to life, understand the life and times that they lived. So when you are um, dealing with cleaning, when I said clear your desk, if you can, you'll want to digitize, you'll want to scan as much as possible. And you're going to want to make a backup of those scanned images, keep it on an external hard drive, put it on a, a thumb drive or a flash drive, and you're going or put it in the cloud. You're going to want to keep a, a record of that. And we've got a flash drives in our safety deposit box at the bank, because about nine years ago, a storm came through Holland and our house was the only one in Holland that was destroyed. We live in the woods and we had several trees land on our house. And unfortunately, um, I had not had everything totally backed up. Now my computer backs up every day uh, because I'm doing genealogy every day. And I said, but anyhow, it did not. And so when the tree hit our house and it landed on the office and it wiped out our computer, I had to start my genealogy all over again. I lost everything. 
keep family photos and artifacts and archival storage. You don't want it to uh, get, you know, deteriorate and you're going to want to take staples out. So the rusting and it doesn't, you know, disintegrate the papers. Once again, set up a filing system that works for you. Keep it organized and keep a store of supplies. So we're going to skip real quick here and talk a little bit about digital organization. And one of the things that I do when we are in person, and I like to see everybody's face cringe a little bit, is about going digital. And so going digital means to create an electronic file to reduce your paper clutter and individual and sheets and books. You know, I am old school. I like to have my files. I like to have my sheets, but I also digitize it just in case of another catastrophe. And losing our house was a catastrophe. You're going to want to save digital files using universal file formats, as we've all heard PDF and JPEG. Well, PDF stands for Portable Document Format, which is usually for text items, things with text on it, words. And a JPEG, which is the Joint Photographic Expert Group, that's also for photos and images, that type of thing. So you'll be working mainly with uh, PDFs and JPEGs. There's a variety of different scanners that you may want to, to consider purchasing, or if you are at a library or, or an archive or something like that, they may have them there for you to use. There are wand scanners, the Flip Pal, and there's it's in parentheses with an asterisk and doxy flip. You can buy these online, but the companies that Flip Pal went out of business and doxy flip has shut down for with COVID because they um with with their work things. So, but you can find these for sale online and uh, you can carry them and take them with you to libraries if they allow that you to use them. Let's say you're going to a cousin's house and they get out a photo album. You may take this and use it to scan photos and all that type of thing. There are flatbed scanners. There are multiple ones. Find out what is going to work for your project and works with your budget. And consistency is the key. When you take a picture of something and scan it, you're going to want to name your file as soon as possible. We've all seen those lines of about 12 to 16 letters and numbers after every single image. Well, if you wait a couple of days to get home, you're not going to remember what these, these documents are. So come up with a name and file them and scan them. Uh, give them a name as you scan them. In your handout, you will be getting a, um, or you do have a software sheet, and I'll show you that in just a moment. And there are different computer programs that you may use. And as you can see here on this uh, slide, that if you decide to use something like Family Tree Maker, uh, that is available, but it, it, it pays. Um, you have to pay for it. Legacy Family Tree. Some of these do not have any dollar signs in front of them. And if you go to the handout, as of mo this past Monday, this handout was updated. It has got, it will tell you what is free and what is paid for, or if there is a fee to use it. A lot of times you may use a basic free program, but then you need to pay to, if you want to expand it and get, as I call, all the bells and whistles, that type of thing. I have noted on here what programs are available for Windows users and what programs are available for Mac users. And some are just Windows only, some of them are Mac only, some of them are for both. Now, down below is also a thing called applications or apps, and those are usually put on your tablets and your, your smartphones. And there are a bunch that are free. And let's say that um, I have used a um, and what I do have is my family tree maker is one of the software programs that I have. There is an app for that and it will sync with my desktop computer or my laptop, whatever I've got. So there are many out here that are available. Um, if you have a subscription to Ancestry, let's say, and you get the app on your phone, then you are able to do research with your subscription on, you know, you'll, the level of subscription that you have on Ancestry will work for your smartphone or your tablet. So it's real good to take those along. Um, and, you know, and just look it over and see what works for your budget and for your needs. So file folders are your friends and you can make a lot of folders on your computer and put folders within folders and keep things quite organized. It's very helpful for when you go to libraries. Um, I do take my carry along file 
because um, certain pages there I do need to write on and fill in. But I also will have a digital file on my tablet, for example. And so when I'm at a library, I take my tablet. And um, I also have a little side note. I purchased one of those little fold apart plate holders. Um, I guess that's what they're called or a book holder. Um, you can get them for three, four dollars at any craft store or Walmart, that type of thing. Um, usually it's got a little hook on it. Well, I use that as a stand for my tablet to put up next to the monitor at a library. So I am looking at my family tree, let's say on Ancestry, and I'm doing the research on my on the monitor at the library of you know whatever database that I'm in. So whether you're at home or on the road, you're going to want to have this stuff. And you just, like I said, you're just going to want to make sure that you are able to get um, download and keep everything the same on all your devices. Okay. Now there are certain ones that um, are available and one of them to keep it on for cloud storage and offline is Evernote. Uh, they have a free version and a, what I call a fee version. It's going to cost you money. So once again, you can put all your discoveries and your scans and stuff on Evernote. Uh, it is searchable and it is a, a storage, like a cloud storage. OneNote is the same thing, but also comes in Microsoft packages. Sometimes people don't even realize that they've got that. Dropbox is a cloud storage. There is a free version but there is also a fee version if you need more space to put all of your stuff up on Dropbox. Caliber is another one, and it's a good one that if you have downloaded many eBooks and you need, uh, like for reference and that type of thing, um, Caliber is great for your eBook management, your, your personal library, whatever you've got. Flickr, um, the, a lot of times people take pictures of headstones and things like that, and they share digital images. Um, you can sometimes, if you know somebody that can uh, go take a picture of the old homestead, um, Flickr, I think is now $50 a year for the extended version, but it's also free to use. And uh, Microsoft Excel or OpenOffice, you're going to want to build spreadsheets um, and with the research log and checklists and your to-do. Um, it's always good to have one of these for each of your surnames. And, you know, let's say you just want to pull everything together of um, all the family that happens to be in Southern Illinois. I happen to know that we've got 11 family surnames down in Southern Illinois, so I can group it by location or by name. So when I get people to kind of cringe about the digital organization, and one thing that I like to pull up is, for those of you that have smartphones and have photos on your smartphones, if your phone got lost today, would you like have a heart attack because you've lost all those pictures and possibly uh, images that you've taken of, of family and friends and documents and all sorts of things? So you're going to want to make sure that you upload these images, make sure you put them in folders and files, and make sure that all of your digital platforms, whether you have a smartphone or a tablet or both, um, uh, a laptop or a desktop computer, you're going to want to get those all cleaned up and organized. And I've been doing this for years, and I have got so much yet still to organize. When I have downtime, uh, when my husband is watching, let's say, some type of a military show on TV in the, in the evening, you know, those ones that were all the planes are gray or all the boats are gray. And I'm kind of like, OK, this is not my cup of tea. I am going to go into the office. I will take that time and start organizing. It, every little bit is going to help. On that list that I showed you earlier um, is computer apps. And this is just a review of making sure that your genealogy and your technology go hand in hand. And these are uh, just a list of different um, apps that may or may not be on your form, such as Billion Graves, uh, What Was There. I'm going to warn you right now, if you go to What Was There, um, I suggest that you bring a beverage and a timer. Uh, you can put in, a, in an address of a place, uh, usually pretty local in your communities. And then you can see over the years what was there and have it morph into what it is today. A lot of buildings in downtown Grand Rapids have this, Detroit, et cetera. Um, there are different things like conferences. And for those of you that may or may not be aware, Roots Tech, uh, it's all one, root, one word. Uh, it is um, from the uh, Family Search. 
um, uh, business. And it is the world's largest genealogy conference. And again, this year, it is going to be uh, March 3rd through March 5th. It is all virtual and it is all free. You need to register. All of the 1,500 sessions that will be offered, it's going to run 24 hours a day for three days. Um, the 1,500 sessions that are being offered, you have one whole year, only if you register, one whole year to view those. And you can save them. They've got a way to save them. They've got a way where you can put in on Family Search, start a family tree, and then they will have a, an activity or a section during that conference where you could click on who you're related to. Are it's called Are We Related? And people that have put in their family trees, it'll pop in. People will be able to contact you, and you will find family, um, guaranteed. I it, it's just an amazing thing. Last year, they had over 1,100,000 people register and attend the conference from 291 countries around the world. So I can't speak high, high, more highly about that. Um, and just a little selfless plug, um, I am honored to have been chosen of one of the approximately 150 speakers to speak at Roots Tech this year. So that's kind of cool. But here's some other ones just for you to, to play with. Uh, history pin is fun um, and, you know, that type of deal. So hints for organizing. Uh, you'll want to get some type of a family tree software. You're going to want to name those photos as soon as possible. Uh, in my phone book, and my husband laughs at me, he will take my phone and show people. I have got more names of funeral homes, cemeteries, sextons, churches, uh, uh, um, you know, relatives, all of that in my phone. I've got more things that deal with searching dead people than I do with actual live people that are relatives. And he just thinks it's hysterical. And but it's 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 you know, you need to have that. You need to have your contacts and, and get that type of thing out. Um, I still have a Rolodex file um, because sometimes it's just easier for me to, to look up a card and get a name um, and, you know, make sure you keep up on that. And backup, you'll want to have that external hard drive. So people often say to me, and I decided to put this next uh, little section in, in, uh, in the, in the uh, presentation thing here, that I've got so much to do and it's going to take forever and I don't have that kind of time. So I am going to give you an example of one of my latest um, sorting, my one of my latest organizational files. And this is from a client and I've got the permission to use it. I am keeping the names private, um, as I'm sure you understand. But this is just one of the things that I needed to organize. And you may come across something like this, or you may already have it. Okay. So here we go. And this is just a little sample of organizing one little piece of one man's life. And so you'll love the, the army green background. I thought that was a real cool touch. And this is dealing with uh, a client file and it's dealing with his military file. And it is dealing with him being in the army. And here are the basic details. I was able to receive and get his whole military file. It was 447 pages long. It covered his 30 years in the service. And it dealt with him being stationed in three different countries. 447 pages. When I sent away for this file and I got the file in a nice box, that type of thing. Uh, I've got a, a certain fellow that does my research or when I'm down there. And not one piece of paper in that 447 pages was in order. It was all over the map. That's the way... It, it came to me. That's the way I got it. So therefore, how do I organize that many pages? So what I did is I had to deal with three decades. And some of you may laugh. Some of you may not. But I happened to have three square laundry baskets. And I sat down on the, on the living room couch. I put three laundry baskets in front of me. I stuck a posty note on it. And one said 1930, one said 1940, one said 1950. So I knew it was for the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. 
And what I did first was I took all 447 pages and it was kind of, I felt like I was kind of like dealing cards. Oh, this page is from 1930, 1950, 1940, on and on and on until I got all the way down and then I stopped. It was like that was enough filing and organization for one day because not on all of these um, military records are the date in the same place. They're not neatly always up in the upper right-hand corner. Sometimes it's in the written part um, of the report. So there was a lot of, of reading and stuff that went on. So then the next thing I did is I took the 1930 basket and I set up an area on the dining room table. I put the leaf in, make it big enough. And I took the 1930s and I then made 12 piles. Everything that was in January, February, March, and so on. That was enough for one day. So then I went through and then I took all of January and I started doing it. Like, if you remember, I said, it's got to be in timeline, you know, chronological order day by day. There was also different sized sheets of paper and those happened to be medical records. And it's like, wait a minute, what do I do with these? I needed to decide what to do. So I once again, sorted them all by month and sorted them by day. Okay. And then after I got that second pile, because they were like almost like half sheets of paper, then I noticed that there were longer legal size sheets. And these were the final reports and also about his retirement and also about his death and his burial. And his burial is at Arlington. So using all those organized files, I had to fill in the details. So I built the timeline. And then I had to decide, was I going to combine all the information from all the files or keep them separate, like the morning reports and, and the, the medical and the daily details? And I decided that it would be best for the family. And I did, did talk to them that it was best to put everything in chronological order. Because if in the middle of the month he went to the dentist or he was in sick bay for a reason or whatever, they wanted to know when that happened. They wanted to read it like a book. So what we ended up doing is we combined all the information and all the files. So then I had a problem. I needed to verify that the date of his birth was the correct date of birth. I wanted to make sure that his date of marriage was correct. And there was only one marriage or were there multiple marriages? And I needed to find death certificates. Okay. I also wanted to verify the places, confirm the family and confirm all the military data and make sure that they were in Germany when the family says they were in Germany or not. And we wanted to, I just wanted to make sure that we could follow the family where they were in Germany and back in the United States and in the Philippines and back in the United States and that type of thing. And I needed to find out the family lore. Did the stories I've heard from my client match the military files. And if it was different, then I needed to dig deeper to find the truth. Okay. I will tell you right now that this soldier lied about his, his uh, date of birth. Um, he used a date of birth that was four years after he was really born. He also claimed that he was in a certain regiment of the army. And it comes to find out, a matter of fact, I'll, I'll just say a Buffalo soldier. And there's, and he boasted about being a Buffalo soldier. There is absolutely no proof at all. He was ever a Buffalo soldier. So I had to really dig and find out. So what was the final outcome? I wrote a report. I cited every one of my sources. I had it all in order and I had to remind the family, I did not write his history. I just reported it. And this is what you're going to find as you get do more and more organizing. So therefore, to kind of do a little bit of a repeat and wind down here, trash or treasure, you're going to scan the items, digitize them if you can. You're going to want that. You want to examine the pages and make sure you turn all the pages that you get over. A lot of times on these medical forms or on other documents, um, you know, little burial cards, there is a code 
a number, whether it's numbers and letters or whatever, you're going to want to find out what that code is. Sometimes if you've looked for these, when you order a military headstone and you find them on, let's say, Ancestry or Fold3 or Family Search, and there is a backside with the code and you want to know what that code means. It's very important. You always check the backside. All right. Rem um, you want to make sure that all of these details are found if you found them in journals or in notebooks, and you want to make sure that they are accurate. I like to have two, if not three, and that's not always possible, places where I have found my facts so I can cite my source. All right. I want to keep a detailed note on any discrepancies, such as that client, client file that I just showed you. Um, if the item does not belong to your family, make the necessary efforts to return an item. You're all going to laugh. My husband doesn't dare take me to an antique store because inevitably I'm going to find a marriage certificate in a frame. I'm going to find some photos with a name on the back. And the next thing you know, I'm buying these things because I am searching, taking that history and searching for the family to return it back to the family because chances are the family did not even know that it was there. Okay. So anyhow, if you are working on your family history and you've got a ton of stuff and we sure don't want anything to happen to you, but eventually the time will come and you want to donate these family items uh, to a, li a library or a repository, um, you're going to want to make sure that's taken care of um, pre-need in all of your documents of your will and that type of thing. You may need to uh, check the library to see if they accept these things. Um, and don't just do your local library uh, because my dad is Welsh and I've got a lot of Welsh information. Um, a lot of it is going to, you know, we'll be going back to the family, the cousins that are still over in Wales. Um, there is a Welsh museum. There's one down in Ohio. There's one out in Nebraska. They take Welsh artifacts and that type of thing. So if your local library doesn't want it, they would, and if they, if you just drop it off and they just throw it away, what a shame. I mean, that's, that's almost criminal to do that. But you know, unless you go to an archives or a museum, they may not be able to uh, take that. So call around and find out that information. And like I said, you know, uh, make sure you've got somebody, hopefully that you can specifically say what they're going to do. So a little bit of fun so that we can, you know, just kind of go out on a fun note is uh, this is the home office and it says you call it chaos and I've call it floor organized. Yeah, I've got boxes and I've got things. It's not that bad, but uh, there are times like when I'm sorting papers and documents. Remember that uh, that old saying, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? You've got a huge project to tackle, okay? Just like my, that military file. You've got to start somewhere. There is no, <coughs> excuse me, um, there is no time. It doesn't have to be done by five o'clock. That type of thing. And when you are all done, I would like to hear from all of you because I want you to be able to tell me that everybody in your family tree has been found. Everything's perfectly organized, including the photos, as says no genealogist ever. But I would love to hear about your success stories. So I'd like to thank Melissa McPherson, the reference librarian at the Willard Library and the Willard Library for uh, having me this evening. Um, as she's going to look through for any questions that you may have posted in the chat, or I don't know if she's going to do open mic or not. Uh, we'll be getting to the questions and answers here momentarily. Um, but also, I want to let you know that um, I one of my groups is the Genealogy Study Group. We meet up in Zealand when we are able to meet, but if not, we are Zooming. Uh, we usually do it the last Saturday of each month. Uh, genealogystudygroup.com or just email me at genealogystudygroup at gmail. And if you want to get on the list for our Zoom meetings and that type of thing, that would be great. Would love to have you. And if you've got any questions that you think of um, down the road, uh, huntingdownhistory at gmail uh, is my address. And so therefore, um, uh, look forward to hearing from any of you if you think of something and, and have a question. And um, that's, I'll keep that up for just a minute and see where we are. So I want to thank you very much. Lisa, are you there? Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot to mention that we did link the handouts on our webpage and on, our, on one of the Facebook postings. I'm very sorry that was on my notes and I forgot when I, at the beginning, 
but that will still be there. If, if anyone wants copies, they can let us know and I can make copies and I'll put it in your folder when you get your little family history sticker. <laughs> um, so my other, I, that was fantastic. And I think we could, I could listen to this all day. That was, there were so many ideas. That's why I have hot tea because the voice starts going by the yeah. time I'm done. Yeah. I also want to give one last shout out to the Calhoun County Genealogical Society. Yes. Um, they're local to Battle Creek and, or for the whole Calhoun County, but they, um, I've met a couple of members that have been very good about and very helpful at helping me plan programs. So um, thank you to them and great, great group of people to get involved with if you are looking for local um, family history or genealogy. So um, that was awesome. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> thank you. There's so much to learn and I just love learning all this and hearing your stories and um, yeah, that was really, that was oh, awesome. Good. Thank you. Good. I got to go buy some colored folders now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, September is a great month because it's back to school sales and, and that's when I stock up, um, yeah. you know, to get everything at a discount because why not? You know, that type of thing, you know, it's, it's fun thing, but yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I don't see any questions. So um, I'll end. But if anyone does have questions in the future, um, stop at the information desk or let me know or you got Megan's contact or I can get a hold of her if she can help us out with something. So sure. um, thank you. Enjoy your snowy night. It might, be, <laughs> it might be a good night to get out some of your stuff and get organized. Absolutely. And crock pots can be your friend. Start That's dinner, right. on, feed the family and you keep playing. So That's right. <laughs> thank you thank so much to the Willard thank Library. You. Thank you so very much for having me. Yep. Thank you very much, Megan. Have a good You're night. Welcome. And thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you everyone.